brilliant people who are here today. Joanna is an artist, writer and producer. Her work is iterative, research-based and focused on performance. It often results in projects with multiple versions or outcomes. Current interests include documentation, procedure, listening, especially eavesdropping, queer domesticity, collaboration and formations of the public. An interest in the speculative, speculative and fantastical underlies this work. Joanna is part of the London-based live art team, I'm With You, which investigates queerness, domesticity, private life and public space. She's also founding partner of Union Docs, a centre for documentary art in Brooklyn, New York. And Martin O'Brien, Martin's work considers existence with a severe chronic illness within our contemporary situation. Martin suffers from cystic fibrosis and his practice uses physical endurance, hardship <coughs> and pain-based practices to challenge common representations of illness and examine what it means to be born with a life-threatening disease. It's going to be a laugh a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, is, his work is an act of resistance to illness, an attempt at claiming agency and a celebration of his body. Martin loves his body and his work is a form of sufferance in order to survive. Martin has been commissioned and funded by Live Art Development Agency, Arts Council England, Arts Catalyst, Midlands Arts Centre, Dadafest, Festival <laughs> so um, the title of this uh, next uh, panel slash conversation is called Oh What a Shame, Sickness, Shame and Performance. So this will begin with a paper delivered from it by a giant called Vicious Viscous Indeterminacy. In it she considers the viscous, slimy, sticky work of Martin O'Brien, an artist who suffers from cystic fibrosis and whose work considers Existence with severe chronic illness within our contemporary situation. Sorry, you Say that again. You hear for the thing. She explores how Brian's work, both solo and in collaboration with artist Shuri Rose, engages with complex notions of potentiality and indeterminacy in the face of the seemingly wholly determined domains of illness and mortality. She considers particularly how O'Brien's use of his own bodily fluids, the unpredictable acoustic effect of his own cough, and his intergenerational collaborations disrupt and queer the dramaturgy of, the, of his durational work, and wider codes of identity and identification. Martin will give an artist talk in which he will show and reflect on examples of his performances. He will consider Shane's ugly sister, disgust, in relation to his work. He will discuss the ways in which his work stages a version of illness which moves beyond the shame often associated with disease through his uncompromising performances of sickness, BDSM, endurance, and mess. These two presentations will be followed by a discussion between Martin and Joanna, in which they will unpick ideas of shame and how they relate to Martin's art. I thought I'd start by showing a, a wee video, which is about four and a half minutes long, and it's just a selection of little clips from different performances, so you get a little taster. And then um, we'll jump right into Joanna's talk, and then my we'll chat to Gala. So this was edited by an um, amazing filmmaker called Sahil Ilyas, who I've collaborated with for about 10 years. Is there any chance we can get the lights out? Oh. 
Yeah. 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 comes from an essay that I've contributed to a book that's coming out about Martin's work, shameless plugging. Um, <laughs> we can talk maybe a little bit more about that um, in the conversation. But um, so yeah, the title of this is uh, Viscous Indeterminacy. It does maybe get a little bit abstract, but we can kind of um, talk through it. Um, I walked into Martin O'Brien's Breathe For Me at the Arnolfini in Bristol, and the first thing I noticed was the smell. And, and this is actually quite a common um, response to perhaps Martin's work. Um, the athletic exertion that the artist was undergoing in a small room with a little ventilation produced a body odor that simultaneously heightened and made strange the otherwise institutional aesthetic um, of the performance space. This space, a gallery, was divided by a long strip of white cloth on the ground, at one end of which was a tub filled with a thick green liquid. The cloth became a kind of catwalk, framing O'Brien's actions over the four hour length of the performance as he inserted needles into his body, dipped his head into the viscous substance in the tub, <coughs> beat his chest rhythmically, and spit into clear and clinical plastic cups and lined them up along the central strip of cloth. A deep cough regularly punctuated these actions. And taken together, all of these materialities complicated the image of O'Brien as a young and physically attractive young uh, man engaged in ritualistic performance art. Like much of his work, this performance derived from O'Brien's experience of living with cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a severe medical disorder largely affecting the lungs. O'Brien produces large amounts of mucus regularly, which has become both a major theme and a significant material in his work. He also draws on the aesthetics of medical treatment, the interplay between the regulated patterns of observation and therapy and the messy materialities of the body, with its textures, smells, shifts in temperature and rhythm. Additionally, O'Brien's queer sexuality is evoked alongside and in conversation with his illness. In his performance, Mucus Factory, for instance, he uses his own mu mucus as, quote, lubrication to fuck my ass with medical equipment, end quote. <laughs> On the one hand, then, O'Brien's practice is highly determined. It's conditioned by his illness, it draws on the concrete materials of his own body, and it reproduces the highly regulated space of the medical institution. However, one of the remarkable things about this intensely physical practice is how the various codes and signals of identity embedded in representations of medical treatment, images of masculinity, and ideas about homosexuality are scrambled, queried, so that a radical contingency fueled by a sense of potentiality emerges. So what does it mean to find potential in a practice so connected with the extreme certainties of illness and mortality? And in this paper, I trace a few examples of O'Brien's practice to try and locate where and how <coughs> contingency and indeterminacy, um, chance and kind of um, not knowing, uh, ripple out, and what kind of politics might ripple out from these. Um, and uh, so I began my inquiry into potentiality um, in performance after an encounter with a visual culture theorist, Irit Rogoff's work on the subject. Um, and she performs a useful twist in her thinking about uh, potential by focusing on impotentiality, on not being or not doing, uh, and what this actually makes possible. Um, she speaks specifically about education and the academy um, and proposes that we rethink these also 
highly regulated spaces in terms of, quote, not doing, not making, and not bringing into being at the very center of acts of thinking, making, and doing, end quote. If school is where learning happens to us, what happens when we pay attention to all the million ways that learning, figured as a, a sort of a linear transmission uh, between teacher to student, um, what happens when that doesn't happen? And what else might we not do? What else might we not be? In what other fields might we think potentiality as impotentiality, uh, resistance as action? And Rogoff is drawing, in turn, on the philosopher Giorgio Agamben's work on potential, um, which has had a major influence on European and North American leftist political thought in its framing of resistance as action. Um, Agamben argues that potential can be thought in terms of ability and knowledge, uh, the capacity to do something, not in general, but specifically. And this potentiality has its own presence. Um, it's not only defined in terms of future actuality. You can think about something as, as existing in potential, um, not only uh, in terms of the future, but in terms of where we are right now. Um, we can experience potential as a mode, and it's a mode that is characterized partly um, in, in, in someone's capacity to not do things. Uh, Agamben writes, the, archi the architect is potential insofar as he has the potential to not build. The poet, the potential to not write poems. This potentiality, Agamben tells us, quote, is a potentiality that is not simply the potentiality to do this or that thing, but potential to not do, potential not to pass into actuality. If potentiality is usually understood as the subordinate of actuality, so it exists in order that things can happen, um, Agamben reverses this relationship. Actuality, things that do actually happen, um, is potentiality that has exhausted impotentiality. It is not not being. Um, we can sort of break that a little bit. But um, this theorizing of resistance as action, I think, is useful uh, for approaching O'Brien's work. Um, he speaks about resistance in literal terms, remarking that, quote, treatment can be seen as a form of medical resistance to illness, end quote. In appropriating the forms and practices of treatment, he both represents and performs the daily labor of resisting not being. He has credited some encouraging lung screenings, for instance, to the physical regimen he undertakes in preparing and presenting his endurance work. Um, but moreover, he resists conventional readings of disability and the sick body, as well as the male body and the queer body, by refusing associations with, for instance, heroic struggle, both in his repetitive and non-cathartic <coughs> actions, and also in his use of uh, things like camp tropes, um, profusions of glitter in, in amongst the um, more kind of regulated um, spaces. He writes, or he says, or no, he wrote, <laughs> maybe he said to me, I don't know. Quote, I use queer imagery as a way of disrupting any triumphant, powerful, macho politics. Then the illness adds something else. I quote, crip up the queer images. This allows me to think about the convergence between being queer and being sick. The illness stops me from being a pretty gay boy, and the queerness stops me from being a macho man or a sick man in need of sympathy." End quote. Because of this insistence on the importance of identity, along with the refusal of essentializing or determinist, deterministic understandings of it, um, so it's both, uh, identity is both important, but it's not essential, I argue, in this work. Um, my thinking about O'Brien's work in connection to potentiality and contingency has been most influenced by uh, the North American um, performance theorist Amelia Jones's concept of a queer feminist durationality. This idea derives from an engagement with philosophers like um, Henri Bergson and Gilles Deleuze, uh, and it's an approach to a sort of open-ended or indeterminate uh, indeterminacy but it's also informed by serious reflection on the specific bodily materialities that were highlighted by the rise of identity politics. So it's an attempt to kind of square the circle between a sort of open, um, non-determined, uh, kind of free space, and the sort of very real like lived experiences that identity produces in us and on us and through us. Um, indeterminacy is important because it can help us rethink actual bodies and the social and political relations in which these bodies engage. In speaking of queer feminist durationality, 
Jones is developing, quote, a revised model of identity politics that accentuates identification <coughs> rather than identity, so it's a process. Um, so that the, uh, as, I, as, I, as I actually just wrote, um, so that the emphasis is on process, which is not fixed, and which unfolds in relationship to others. O'Brien's work, explicitly queer, and engaging with challenging ableist representations of sickness and patriarchal constructions of gender, operates precisely with this type of indeterminacy and relationality applied to material specificities that Jones describes. Interestingly, while Jones focuses especially on visual culture, one of the most striking features of O'Brien's queer feminist durationality is aural. Um, the cough is the voice of disease, O'Brien writes. Elsewhere he says, quote, it is the forceful establishment of a differential voice, one that does not adhere to language, the voice of illness. The cough interrupts. It is something that cannot be contained and demands its right to be heard, end quote. While the cough does not, quote, adhere to language, it does communicate. However, while conventionally what the cough communicates is threat um, or warning, and O'Brien talks about uh, the anxious reactions he receives when he coughs uncontrollably on pu public transportation, for instance, um, in the framework of his performance, it becomes an unpredictable force which dictates the indeterminable, <coughs> indeterminate structures of his actions. So he's kind of going through these very sort of planned rituals <coughs> and then the cough happens and um, it sort of disrupts those, those uh, well-laid plans. Nevertheless, for all of the potent potentialities and viscous indeterminacies of O'Brien's work, some things may be inevitable. For instance, at a certain point, it became clear that O'Brien would need to confront the legacy of Bob Flanagan. Flanagan was a Los Angeles-based artist, also uh, with cystic fibrosis, who became well-known in the 1980s and 90s for his performances with his longtime partner and dominatrix, Cherie Rose. Informed uh, by their lifestyle BDSM, inflected by dark humor, and significantly contributing to the development of the then nascent endurance performance genre. Flanagan died of cystic fibrosis in 1996 at the age of 43, but his continued legacy means that responses to O'Brien's work unavoidably draw parallels with this early practice. What was perhaps less predictable was that O'Brien would go on to develop a new collaboration with Rose explicitly referencing Flanagan and re-performing some of the pair's iconic pieces. O'Brien was able to connect with Rose, who largely moved away from performing after Flanagan's death, while working on Mucus Factory with performance artist Ron Athey as his mentor. Athey, also a hugely influential practitioner of body art and endurance performance, had known Flanagan well and remains friends with Rose. After corresponding online, O'Brien met Rose in person two hours before they recreated 100 Reasons, a piece Rose and Flanagan collaborated on with the artist Mike Kelly, in which Rose spanks Flanagan with a paddle 100 times, while Kelly reads, quote, a list of 100 appropriate names for a paddle. The recreation, performed at the Access All Areas Symposium in 2011, was neither quite homage nor heteronormative reproduction, but something altogether more queer. O'Brien is easily young enough to be Rose's child, not grandchild, um, but is standing in for her dead lover, partner, collaborator. O'Brien writes, quote, watching Flanagan, I saw my future, and in this action, Rose remembers her past. I am her fucked up Romeo in a game of remembering Bob. She is my way of honoring the work that defined my disease in the art world. In the here and now of the performance, past and future converge, and the potential for new relations and new readings of these bodies is made sharply present which eat, which with each smack. More recently, O'Brien has worked with Rose to explore the potentiality of the archive. In 1995, Flanagan and Rose received a Guggenheim Fellowship to create a series of works uh, that would be proposed as uh, the Death Trilogy. Only the first of these was created. Called Death Coffin, the piece involved a coffin with the head section removed uh, open to reveal a TV set showing a video of Flanagan's face. But as the viewer got closer, a camera took a photograph of their face and replaced Flanagan's face with the viewer's. Um, so all of a sudden you're seeing a, a, 
of image of yourself um, in this poem. After Flanagan passed away in 1996, the grant was taken away from Rose, um, pretty outrageously. Though Rose applied for the grant with the same project the next year, she was denied. In January of 2015, O'Brien traveled to Los Angeles to work with the One Archive at the University of Southern California, which holds Flanagan and Rose's archive, and to continue collaborations with Rose. Over the course of working together, they decided to reimagine the second part of the Death Trilogy. This would involve effectively creating an absent piece, a piece that existed only as a plan, only as potential. The original conception of this piece was going to involve a coffin filled with confetti <coughs> made from tiny photographs of Flanagan's face. In the reimagined version, O'Brien and Rose created an effigy of Flanagan and placed it in a coffin and filled the surrounding space with confetti made from photocopies of images from the archive. A live performance element accompanied the piece, involving O'Brien and Rose lying on tables in a separate room, first covered in sheets and then getting painted white all over their bodies. After this, they led the audience into the room with the coffin, and the audience was invited to shovel the photograph confetti into the coffin. In a third and final section, they processed with the coffin outside and placed it into a prepared grave. In establishing this collaboration with Rose, which involves an intense process of approaching both physical and emotional pain, O'Brien is choosing to recreate a very queer community, both with Rose and with a man who died, when O'Brien was a small child and living halfway around the world. He's choosing to embrace a complex relationality, which is not particularly gentle, but definitely generative. He's finding, po he's finding points of contact through his illness and allowing this contact to be a force with dri which drives his practice in unpredictable ways. I started this paper by asking what it means to occupy a position of potentiality and contingency in the face of the certainties of mortality. With this artist's practice, it means relationality, it means the materiality of bodies, and it means a here and now, both forcefully occupied and used as a platform to access there and then, and open up to what comes next. so much, Joanna. Um, so one of the things, um, I'm glad Joanna sort of talked about my work with Cherie, and one of the things I've been doing with Cherie at the moment is um, she's sort of established her own religion. And uh, I was thinking about this, and it's, it's quite, tough. everything I say during this talk, take with um, various sizes of pinches of salt. <laughs> um, and <coughs> what, one of the things that uh, the, the religion is about is, um, like rethinking our relationship to pain, um, accepting pain as something that happens in life, um, and thinking of ways of being with it. Um, and the kind of catchphrase is keep breathing. As long as we're breathing, mm -hmm. we're still going. Um, and I was brought up Catholic, and, I was, and, and when Jordan invited me to talk at this, I was thinking, shame uh, uh, isn't something that I always necessarily think about, but it's there somehow um, in my practice. And I thought, where have I encountered shame the most? And I thought, oh, as a Catholic. <laughs> I'm no longer practicing Catholic, but I still love Christmas, and I still love flagellation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what I thought I'd do for you today is um, I've written a sermon for you uh, to try and convert you all to, to the religion. And the religion is called the St. Bob Flanagan s and Chapel, where Bob where Bob sort of takes on the position of the, the um, I guess, like the God figure. But it's not supernatural, there's no real God in this. And it's, it's a, it's a, of course, it's, you can see it's a critique. Okay, um, so here is my sermon on sickness. In the name of the mistress, and of the slave, and of the ghost of Bob, the prophet rode into a small town with her 12 disciples of sickness, 
It was warm, and this town was known for its healthy people. Everyone had a tank. Everyone loved to swim and play football. No one ever coughed in this town, and everyone that sneezed was put into quarantine. Anyone that was sick soon fled the town as they were no longer welcome. The dying moved to neighbouring towns where they could receive treatment. Everything in this town was clinical and clean, and the town was full of health food shops, and people seemed to live off salad. <laughs> in the restaurants, everything was described as foraged, hand-picked, or locally harvested. No one ever showed any real emotions in this town. There were never any orgies, and no one liked BDSM. Sex was done once a week with the likes of missionary style, mainly by younger people in order to have children once they were in stable relationships, because most people were heterosexual and the few that weren't were gay rather than queer. The people here were neither happy nor sad because they didn't have the emotional capacity to truly feel. Everyone had an expensive car and a big house in this town. Everyone had plenty to eat. No one particularly liked or disliked each other in this town, and it was usually warm weather. There was a beautiful coast nearby, and people with perfect bodies loved to bathe here. Nothing exciting ever happened in this town, and people tried to outdo each other. Bigger houses, faster cars, there was little need for hospital in this town. Its main use was as a place where the citizens could get plastic surgery, bigger dicks, bigger breasts, chiselled faces, and luscious lips. Many of the people looked the same as each other. This was a town of younger people. The elderly all moved away when they realised um, there was nowhere to get the treatment they actually needed and when they saw that they were no longer respected. As they left, they remembered the ways they used to treat the elderly when they were young and wished they had done it differently. This was the perfect town if you were healthy, pretty and rich. The prophet and her 12 disciples of sickness came to the town because they had heard about this place and its lack of sickness and of the values they cherished so dearly. The prophet was disgusted at the health and the wealth of the town. As she entered the town, the sound of the disciples' coughs rang out through the streets. People heard the sound and bolted themselves inside for fear of becoming sick. The streets were empty, the sun was setting, and the prophet took to the bandstand in the main square to preach, but nobody came. The disciples knocked on the doors, but people looked out of their windows and saw the sickly-looking visitors and didn't answer. Only the sick will survive, preached the prophet. We are here to spread the good word, fight sickness with sickness. After a few minutes of preaching, a healthy woman came to the prophet and said, Prophet, I have lived in this town all of my life. I do not know what it is to suffer, but I also do not know what it is to feel love or to feel happiness. Will you show me how to feel, O oh prophet? The prophet looked at the healthy woman and said, Sikaluya, yeah. <laughs> you will be cured of this curse of health. I bestow upon you the gift of sickness. With that, the prophet laid their hands on the woman and she immediately began to cough. She returned home and left her boring, misogynistic husband. People witnessed this through their windows and began to come out to watch. Soon a large crowd gathered in the square. And another person said, please prophet, show me the ways of the sick. The prophet placed their hands on the person and they too began to cough. With the cough came uh, a new take on life, a new understanding of existence. Soon people were queued up in front of the prophet. The prophet uh, gave out the gift of sickness through the night and the sound of fast cars zooming around was replaced by the sound of coughing. The hospital, which was once a place where rich people could get plastic surgery, soon became a place of care. The town hall was transformed into a disco for the infected. The beach became a place of all, where people of all ages and body types could meet and philosophise about what it means to be alive. Everyone started experimenting sexually. The prophet and the twelve disciples of sickness watched as the town collapsed and a new society started to form. Outsiders from around the country started to gather in this town because it became a haven for anyone that didn't fit in elsewhere. Those who wanted to remain healthy fled for a new town. Those who wanted things to return to the old way left but couldn't sell their big houses because no rich people wanted to move here. Instead, the houses became accommodation for many people. The doors were always open. There was no crime or homelessness. Everyone, uh, eventually, 
the prophet and her disciples left. They could not stay here, although they longed to do so. They needed to go and spread the gift of sickness elsewhere. So one night, they rode out of town, leaving behind a chorus of coughing. In the name of the mistress and of the slave and of the ghost of Bob. second part of the sermon, children, is, um, is a way for you to deal with shame. This is a sermon on, on shame. This is, a, is my kind of preaching around how we should deal with shame, and I've used this word shamed in order to help do this. In shamed, in, in my version of shamed, S is for shortcomings. Turn your shortcomings into a weapon. Embrace vulnerability. Embrace witness, weakness. If they tell you you can't sing for shit, then sing louder. I was born with a genetic disease, cystic fibrosis. I grew up knowing that I would die when I was 30, but I didn't, and I'm still here, surviving. People think about illness as a shortcoming, but I think of it more as a superpower. Bob Flanagan once said, you've got to play the hand you're dealt, so here I am playing that hand, and I'm a fucking virtuoso at it. Sickness is political. If you're sick, you can't not be in a political relationship with the world. I've always been in this position, but now that I've outlived my life expectancy, it's changed, it's more intense, I'm living my zombie years. I've been making art, um, I've been making art that uses the zombie to talk about being sick dying young, and how the so-called shortcomings of sickness could actually be a weapon. The zombie has shortcomings. It's slow, it's rotting as it moves, and it's thick as pig shit. But in every zombie movie and TV show, the horde of undead manages to topple capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> the, the apocalypse comes at the end of these rotters. In my videos and performances, I've dressed as zombies in crappy makeup. I've bitten audience members. In the film, The Unwell, I created a world where only these coughing beings called the unwell could live. I imagine it as a place where sickness becomes the desired state of being. It's no longer a shortcoming, but something to strive for. It's the only way to survive. Only the sick can survive in this world. Being sick becomes a lifeline a way to live in a hostile environment. It becomes the only way to be. Sickness can be life-affirming. It can be a way of surviving, of enduring, of living. There is no other way. There is no other option but to join the unwell. Those who learn to embrace sickness thrive. The rest become prey. The rest are just meat. The rest cannot evade death. Only the sick will survive. H is for humiliation. A lot of my work is solo, but I often collaborate with Cherie Rose. Oh, you've heard that. Um, Cherie was the partner of Bob Flanagan, who died in 1996. Together, they made art that explored pain, illness, love, and death. They often used BDSM, and Flanagan was Cherie's full-time slave. Since 2011, I've made work where I become a substitute for Bob. Cherie is now 76, and we explore our two bodies as we both think about death and dying. Cherie loves to perform public humiliations on me, spankings, making me crawl around and beg like a dog, and I fucking hate dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Feeding me baby food, putting, me, uh, putting on a strap on, and then fucking me up the arse in a bathtub in a church in Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> Once she turned me into a cake, which doesn't sound that bad, but when you hear that we went to the shopping mall, the um, supermarket, and in order to find out how much cake she needed, she made me lay on the floor and then put all the cakes on top of me to count how many we needed. Um, BDSM and public humiliation are central practices in this chapel. Everyone must practice being humiliated and take it. No, enjoy it. Bask in the pink-faced agony of humiliation. Learn to enjoy the loss of control. It's nothing to be ashamed of. A is for abashed. My cough can be heard bellowing out down corridors. It shakes the neighbor's house as if there was an earthquake. On the trains, people strain to get away. Other people cough politely, abashed at the sound coming from their body. Shame, oh the shame, but not me. 
and not you other S&M chaplers out there. We bask in the cough, it's almost a mating call. The cough is sexy, it's loud and it demands our right to be alive. It tells you that I'm still here. If the cough can be a detonation of the voice, it's also the establishment of a different one, one that doesn't adhere to language. This is the voice of illness. The cough interrupts, it's something that cannot be contained and demands its right to be heard. So go out into the streets and cough. Spread the word, let the abashed turn away, for we are the abashers. M is for mortification. I've worked with the mortification of my flesh constantly. Mortification actually means to subdue, one, to subdue one's bodily desires. We at the chapel do not ask you to refrain from any bodily desires, but we do consider discipline as very important, as you can probably tell. <laughs> so we ask you to subdue your bodily desires for as long as possible, but only in order to heighten the feeling when you do finally give in to the desire. Remember that discipline breeds desire and there's no shame in desire. So go out and desire until it becomes so strong that you can no longer take it. And then, enjoy it. That's me being fucked up the arse in the bathtub in the church in Ipswich by Cherie who's wearing a strap on. <coughs> e is for exasperation. We at the chapel are exasperated. Not with our bodies, we love our bodies. Not with our sickness, for we know that only the sick can survive. We are exasperated at those who need the chapel most, but will never come. We are exasperated with the right wing and the fascists. We are exasperated at the big dick men with big fucking guns. And we are exasperated at the poverty and the racism and the homophobia and the sexism. And remember this, is a new religion, so we're still in the Old Testament stage, so that means we can be vengeful and wrathful, <laughs> and there's no fucking shame in that. <laughs> and finally, D is for disgust, shame's ugly sister. Perhaps my favourite part of the sermon, everything I do is caught up in this most vile of feelings, the chapel, my art, everything. I stand here and try to embrace the monstrous, the disgusting. My mucus is a material to use. Um, my shit, my blood, my piss are all materials. Sickness is disgusting, but that's nothing to be ashamed of. So take the chance to be disgusting whenever possible, to offend good taste. Do it without shame. Other people will feel that for you. In the name of the mistress, and of the slave, and of the ghost of Bob. Thank you. Amen. Sickalooya. So I think we've got about maybe 15 minutes, um, and I, I will like open up, um, but I've got, I had a couple of thoughts, um, and um, <coughs> the first was to do with um, kind of reflecting on, on the conversation that immediately preceded us, and this kind of sense that um, in, it's kind of in the face of the sort of um, rhetoric of pride that um, shame becomes kind of specifically palpable. And, what I, I find really sort of um, exciting about your work is that it's not about kind of recuperating some kind of pride, it's about sort of maybe occupying um, shamelessness. And that, that there's a sort of an interesting kind of triangulation away from a sort of um, celebration and into, I really like what you said about um, uh, uh, weaponizing shame. Um, so that it's not about kind of um, uh, uh, creating some sort of, um, you know, um, accommodation with this sort of oppressive society. It's about actively kind of um, uh, shamelessly uh, kind of, um, you know, fighting. And I, I wondered if you could kind of talk about that. And Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. That, that, that I guess what I'm, I am interested in being with shamelessness. And, you know, I, I loved when you were talking about the, 
the shame associated with bodily fluids and the leaking because um, bodily control is so important that, that when we lose control of the body, that, that, that's when shame becomes involved. And I guess my project my whole life has been thinking about how that doesn't have to be shameful, but that, that we can be with that as a shameless activity and, and kind of bask and find some sort of perverse enjoyment in it. You know, but likewise, I wouldn't, use, I wouldn't really think in, in terms of ideas of pride that it seems, that seems too much um, like fitting into a kind of ableist idea of, of what we should be. And I think the idea of pride maybe slips too into, into the idea of, of the sick person as the hero, uh, like the, the, the heroic mode of thinking about illness where, where you go, good on Martin who's, who's surviving despite having this illness. But it's not despite having illness is what I'm saying. It's, you know, it's because of having illness. Oh, it's with, it's with illness. And it's with um, a shamelessness of illness and, and an enjoyment and... That's what, I think that's where the, the politics sit. And then it's, it's rethinking how we might be sick, how we might be with sickness. And it's rethinking that as, as a shameless activity and as one that can be celebrated in, in a perverse way. Yeah. Embrace the, the thing of embracing your monstrous or, or being the most disgusting version of yourself. A performance is a space where I can sort of do that. Right, um, just because I know we don't have a ton of time, open up and see if there are any kind of responses or, or um, anything that anybody wants to bring up. As it were. <laughs> As it were, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> or blessings. Yeah, blessings. We could do blessings. We could take confessions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Martin, I'm wondering because you actually um, talk about Catholicism and always think about the original sin that is connected with guilt and the first shame. Whether guilt plays a role <coughs> in your work, if you have ever addressed the notion of guilt connected with shame? Um, no, not exactly. I mean, I, I guess there's maybe specific, specific, uh, specificities of, of illness going on, you know, so cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that you're born with and so often my sort of um, reactions that people have had towards me is one of sympathy um, rather than the kind of bullshit reaction that people might get for other kinds of illness that interrupt part way through life um, and I mean the sympathy one is also a kind of bullshit reaction but um, it's a different kind of reaction but you know, I've been thinking a little about guilt in some way recently and, and thinking about that in relation to my mum and dad as well and, you know, what, what that means, that they sort of gave birth to a sick child and we've never really, we've never had that conversation. Um, but, it w would, you know, I, I have a good relationship with them. I don't know, I don't know how they feel about that, but I've, you know, I've been thinking about that recently in terms of emotions around disease, like what, what does it mean to bring a sick child into the world. And, you know, for me, it's something to celebrate, but for many people, it isn't. You know, so that, that would be a really interesting conversation to have around that. I, related to that, one thing that I've been thinking about in terms of your relationship with Cherie is this kind of, um, I wanted to ask you about reproduction, I guess, and the way that, um, uh, particularly the way that your work with Cherie's archive is a sort of a form of reproduction because you're kind of, um, uh, you know, extending the life of this work, extending the kind of um, circulation of this archive. And yeah, I wonder what you thought about that. One of the things that's really important to me is history as well. So there's, you know, something about the history of, of particular art practice, the history of people with particular illnesses and the kind of activism that might go with that. And, you know, so, so for me, um, the, the relationship with Cherie is, is because we sort of completely adore each other, but also because we, um, you know, the, the reason I reached out to her in the first place was, was this idea of history and how we might um, give voice to people who were kind of forgotten in history. So with Bob dying quite young, 1996 he died, he was 43, but at the time he was one of the longest living survivors with cystic fibrosis, one of the oldest people in the world. Um, so that there was something about an early life and when that cuts off, that the, the kind of the the ability to keep practicing kind of vanishes with that. 
and Cherie sort of being being ignored as as a woman and as as the one who was on the periphery of that practice. So Bob was the sort of star of the practice. And you know, it guys back to the story that you told where they got the Guggenheim fellowship, Bob dies and then they revoke the fellowship and then Cherie reapplies, you know, the following year with the exact exact same application and they turn it down. And you know, there's the fucking misogyny in the art world right there. And um, so to like al allow those voices to come through, the people that are forgotten in history is important. So, yeah, I just, thank you for sharing um, your work. It was really difficult for me to watch a lot of that. Um, and uh, there was a lot in the discussion that I wouldn't uh, immediately agree with. It was nice to be confronted with like a different that was quite refreshing because it's, it's not something that I've encountered before. So I just wanted to talk to you about how you came to this kind of positive reevaluation of your own, of your of cystic fibrosis. I don't want to call it an illness because that sounds, it has kind of that, that negative kind of evaluation associated with it, like in common parlance, right? So how did you come to kind of have this uh, reevaluation um, of this condition? and? In relation to that, I mean, looking at your art, I mean, it deals a lot with taboo, right? And when you're looking at, you know, some of your performances, and especially kind of with the um, bodily fluids that you kind of use and kind of try to embrace, I mean, what strikes you is you, you never see this is a person that's suffering with a condition. Um, and that's because of the engagement with taboo, because what's going on is actually far more demanding of your attention than, you know, like, the, the condition. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit about kind of, yeah, how you came to reevaluate your own kind of relationship with your condition and also, like, how taboo is used as a way of kind of diminishing or taking away from or, like, you know, drawing our attention away from the, the condition. Yeah. So, yeah but, but thanks, yeah. It was, it was powerful. Thank you. Um, for, well, the first, the, to the second part, this word sickness is sort of important to me because in the word sickness, you know, it deals with like biological sickness, but there's also a kind of moral implication. People say, that's sick, you know, as in that's disgusting. Or now, the thing that I love is the reuse of the word sick as to me, that, that when I teach the students, say, that's sick means it's really good. And so, sick <laughs> But sick, as a, as a word that, that is both meaning illness, but also meaning a kind of judgment. Yeah, exactly, there's yeah. judgment. You know, so, so for me, one of the things of thinking about like the taboo side of my practice is through this idea of sickness, like to create work that might, might attack the senses of a spectator, that might be difficult to watch, and that can be sick both as a, um, an illness, but as a strategy for making work as well. Um, and then the first thing about, the first part of the question about how I came to it um, is actually one of, the, one of the first times I started to think about disease differently was flicking through a book and seeing a photograph um, of a groin, a man's groin that was sewn up and nailed to a plank of wood and going, oh, what's that? And then reading the description and it was Bob Flanagan the arts of cystic fibrosis who I'd never heard of at the time, and read the description. Bob Flanagan had cystic fibrosis and was a, um, a masochist and worked with Shariva, so this description about their work and then going, oh, fuck. I was about 18 and I didn't, didn't think about, at the time, about art and performance as a place where I could explore identity politics. <laughs> and then seeing that, just, that way it just completely changed my life. And, the way that I thought about it, just seeing that image, finding more about their work, and then thinking about well, like, what are other ways to be with illness? And that's why the, the zombie is so generative and exciting to me, because it's like this sick body that, that has a different kind of power. So, you know, I said, take these things with a pinch of salt, you know, which is true, but also that, that idea where, where society is toppled and the zombies take over, where sickness is, is the only way to live. If you're not bit, then you're running around trying to survive and you're gonna die eventually. But if you give in and become a zombie, you have a lot more fun.
Um, hi, this is sort of a comment for both of you, really. Um, I was thinking about sort of the words that have sort of been brought up in terms of like potentiality, impotentiality, um, sort of shame and pride and sort of living within this shame and, and bringing forth this kind of potentiality through this impotentiality. And it made me think of the notion of precarity and both through illness and both through queerness, there's a level of lived precarity. And in terms of, you were mentioning Joanna, in terms of um, the trajectory, through that precarity, the trajectory becomes fractalized. So it's no longer this sort of, I mean, connection to the queer feminist durationality. Um, and it's more of a comment just to see what, you, you know, your thoughts on this kind of thing. Um, but through this fractalization, sort of the fact that you mentioned that you're, you're, pa you're past your life expectancy, you've exceeded, so you've, you've gone past this idea. Um, but it's, for me, it's, it's in this sort of fractalized precarity that becomes this pr production, so that it becomes these new forms and these new um, things through these non-things and through these um, creations, through these lack of expectations, um, which is why sort of your pieces are so um, powerful for me. Um, yeah, so I just wanted more of a comment. Can I, can I ask you to say a little bit more about what you mean by fractal? Fractal, in terms of, um, without going to chaos theory, um, sort of the, the idea that the, this is trajectory through, so if we take like the life expectancy of, of you know, this movement through, through time in a quite forward trajectory, um, and with precarity, that becomes fractalized because that of that sort of ruptures and instabilities so of sort that of non situation. Non-linearity. Non-linear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I to I guess to respond to the sort of sense of um, <coughs> I think that yeah the, the I think precarity is a really good interesting um, way into this work and it kind of goes back I think to what we, you were saying about the sort of weaponizing of shame, right? So the thing that makes a sort of a precarious existence sort of politically um, disruptive is also the thing that kind of makes the sort of subject of precarity um, uh, vulnerable um, and sort of available uh, to, to violence of, of all kinds of things. And so it's, a, it's this sort of um, this tension um, uh, where it, on, on the one hand, there is this kind of um, uh, possibility of a kind of latent political power, um, but it's also this, um, uh, it's also this kind of, um, uh, you know, availability to, su to suffering. And I think that that's actually ac exactly um, sort of where your work is interesting uh, for me. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it's been amazing hearing how you've kind of queered uh, a sense of shame or disgust through your work as an artist, but I wondered, do you, are you affected, uh, and if so, how, by the shame or disgust or the abashment or whatever that you um, encounter from audiences? Are they ashamed of it? No, no. Um, no, no. Affected. By their shame. Uh -huh. You know, you're, you're working with yours, you've explained how you're reclaiming that or, or using it as material. Um, but I wondered whether you encounter other people's shame, that, that they are confronted with their shame if they uh, encounter your work. It's interesting, because, I mean, in, in the moments of performance, it's really hard to sort of gauge what's going on with people. People walk out all the time, but that could be for all number of reasons, and it's quite understandable. Um, and I, th I think after the performance, the, 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 re the responses when I talk to people are usually um, kind of interesting that people tell me their stories of sickness and uh, you know that like age old idea of the wounded storyteller <laughs> it's like almost oh, comes to fruition where, where you, you, you perform sickness and then people come and tell you their experiences of sickness and say thank you that really moved me I say oh thank you and then they stand there and go, oh, they've got something else that they want to say. <coughs> it moved me because, and then they sort of tell the story. There's, there's, there's something kind of interesting in that, opening up a, a space uh, like where, where I could ask people also not to be ashamed of that. <coughs> Thank you, that was really interesting. I really enjoyed both those presentations. Um, 
Joanne, I wanted to ask you something because I was quite startled to hear you describe the performance, the original performance by Bob Flanagan and Sheree Rose as being heteronormative. No, I, I, I said it was not heteronormative. Um, so no, I, I think you... Oh my, I, I, did the, I misunderstand? I thought you said that the new performance wasn't heteronormative and the first one was. No, I was talking about um, uh, what I was sort of asking Martin about uh, in terms of a kind of reproduction. So they yeah. were kind of... Um, I'm suggesting that what um, they're doing uh, by kind of revisiting this work is sort of um, rethinking how we can sort of... Um, uh, deal with reproduction in ways that aren't heteronormative. Um, and so that's not really to do, so it's, uh, if, if, if Martin is sort of positioning himself as this weird sort of um, time-fucked, like, child of um, Shuri and Bob, yeah. um, one of whom he's never met, um, uh, and then simultaneously kind of taking the place of Bob, it's this quite interesting, I think, sort of, non-heteronormative version of, of, of reproduction. Um, so it's not about, I'm sorry, I, I, I still don't quite get it. So you're not saying that the, the original one was a heteronormative? No, no, no. Okay, that's completely my misunderstanding, <laughs> and I'm so pleased yeah. about that. <laughs> no. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, not at all. And I, 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 what you. I would say even is that the, those kind, that kind of uh, initial practice is what kind of creates the conditions for this, like, very complex and interesting kind of re-engagement. Um, yeah, and they both yeah. sound amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I guess it's like a, I guess it's like <laughs> process rather than the thing. Like the process is not mm. heteronormative. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, that could be. There could be a like heteronormative version of I understand. That. It was bugging me very much, and now I understand. I'm not an academic. <laughs> Thank you.